Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Ren Marouf. I'm a third year medical student. And today I'll be giving you a session on the anterior and posterior pituitary hormones. Now, it's a very easy and simple lecture. Um, so I based off my slides, uh, based off uh, Dr. Simon's slides, and we'll just be going over them and trying to simplify everything and try to interconnect all of the different information. Uh, so it should be fine. This is my contact below if you need any help or have any questions and let's start. Okay, so before we uh, proceed with the lecture, let's just orient ourselves to the pituitary. So the pituitary is an organ that has, uh, it's, a, it's a gland actually, and it has two lobes, okay? It has the anterior lobe and the posterior lobe. Now the anterior lobe is also called the adenohypophysis and the posterior lobe is also called the neurohypophysis. Uh, the anterior pituitary is further divided to three different parts. That's the pars temporalis, the pars intermedia, and the pars distalis. We're mainly concerned with the pars distalis for this lecture. Now, the pituitary is normally under the control of the hypothalamus, and there's a functional connection between them known as the pituitary stalk or infundibulum. So infundibulum, pituitary stalk, that's the same thing. And the function of this stalk is to connect the hypothalamus to the pituitary. Now, what do we mean when we say that the pituitary is under the control of the hypothalamus? This means that the pituitary doesn't just decide to secrete uh, hormones on its own. It has to receive an order from the hypothalamus to secrete those hormones. How does this happen? The hypothalamus has a bunch of hormones called the hypophysiotropic hormones or releasing hormones. So that's the same thing. You can think of those releasing hormones as, as a secretary that the hypothalamus sends to the anterior pituitary. So it will send one of those releasing hormones. The anterior pituitary will perceive that signal. Okay, we can start releasing hormones now. And it will start releasing its own hormones. This is kind of the simplified version. We'll talk about, we'll talk about the, the different, uh, like the mechanism of action, the precise mechanism of action uh, as the lecture proceeds. So First slide, like we said, two lobes, uh, anterior, posterior, pituitary, under the control of the hypothalamus, linked by the pituitary stalk. One thing that's important to note is that the pars distalis has five different cells, and those five different cells secrete six different hormones. So we have six hormones coming from the anterior pituitary. Now, the last point over here, it's important to note that all endocrine functions of the anterior pituitary are regulated by the hypothalamus by something we call negative and positive feedback loops. Now, what does this mean? When we say positive feedback loop, it means that the, both the, the perpetuator of this loop and the outcome of this loop are going in the same direction. An example of this is childbirth. So when oxytocin is being released, it starts uh, causing contractions in the uterus. And the more those contractions, uh, obviously those contractions happen so that the mom can deliver the baby, uh, the stronger the contractions become, the more oxytocin is released. And the more oxytocin is released, the stronger the contractions will become. Okay, so it's it's kind of, that, that's what we mean by a positive feedback loop. So it's going in the same direction, on and on and on. And it just becomes more and more and more. For negative feedback, it's exactly the opposite. They're going in different directions. An example of this is regulating body temperature. So when our body temperature rises to more than 37 degrees, the body senses, okay, this temperature is more than the normal set point. So it will start uh, trying to bring that temperature down. One way is by activating the sweat gland. So we want the person to start sweating so that the person can start cooling down, okay? So the more the sweat glands are activated and the more sweat is being released, the lower the temperature becomes, okay? So they're going in different directions. That's what a negative feedback loop is. Now, the five different types that I told you guys about, the five different cells, are the somatotropes, lactotropes, thyrotropes, corticotropes, and gonadotropes. Now, each one of these secretes uh, specific hormones. 
So somatotropes secrete growth hormone, lactotropes secrete prolactin, that's how you can remember it, thyrotropes uh, release the thyroid stimulating hormone, so thyro, thyroid, cortico, Tropes produce the adrenocorticotropic hormone. Okay, that's how we can remember it, cortical, cortical. And gonadotropes release the FSH and LH. Just think gonadotropes, uh, it's, it's talking about the gonads. So it makes sense that it's FSH and LH because they affect the gonads. Now, like we said, the, the release of these hormones by these cells from the anterior pituitary it doesn't just happen because the pituitary wants to release those hormones. It has to receive an order from the hypothalamus. And like I told you guys, this order comes in the form of a hormone from the hypothalamus. Now, those hormones being released from the hypothalamus to order the pituitary are called hypophysiotropic hormones or releasing hormones. Now, let's talk more about how is it being regulated? So within the hypothalamus, there is a specific region that we are uh, concerned with. This is called the hypophysiotropic region of the hypothalamus. Okay, you can see over here the different uh, cell bodies. And those cell bodies have axons that will project to the infundibulum or the pituitary stalk, specifically in an area called the median eminence. Okay. So the median eminence is in the pituitary stalk, okay? Now, one thing about the median eminence is that it's heavily vascularized. So there's a lot of blood vessels in this area, a lot of blood supply in this area, okay? So the releasing hormone will go down from the hypothalamus. It will go to the median eminence. The blood vessels at the median eminence will pick up this hormone and it will go through the primary capillary plexus, then through the secondary capillary plexus, to eventually supply the pars distalis of the anterior pituitary. Now, when the hormones are moving through the blood and they finally reach the pars distalis, they have specific receptors to bind onto. Once they bind to those receptors in the pituitary, the pituitary will, will receive that signal and start releasing its own hormones. We call this uh, blood vessel system that's delivering the hormones the hypophysial portal system. Now, um, okay, like I, like I told you guys, uh, they bind to their specific uh, receptors, and this is how the pituitary knows that I can start releasing my own hormones. Now, an example of, of this is thyroid stimulating hormone from thyrotrope cells in the anterior pituitary. It doesn't just get released on its own. It will receive a signal, which is the thyroid releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. Thyroid releasing hormone will bind to its specific receptors. And then the thyrotropes will start releasing TSH, which is thyroid stimulating hormone. Now, we need to talk about the endocrine axis. This, is, this basically has to do with regulation. Now, the endocrine axis is composed of the uh, hypothalamus, the anterior pituitary, and the peripheral endocrine glands. What does this mean? The hypothalamus sends signals to the anterior pituitary. The pituitary will release its different hormones, and those different hormones will go to affect different glands in the body. Why is this important to know? Because when we have any endocrine uh, disease, we need to know at what level is this disease happening. So if it's happening at the level of one gland, so just one gland in the body, let's say the testes, all other glands are functioning normally, we know that we call this a primary endocrine disease. This means pituitary is working just fine, hypothalamus is doing just fine. So the pituitary is sending all of its hormones to all different glands, but the problem is that this specific gland, this specific gland is not able to release its specific hormone. When the problem happens at the level of the pituitary, we call this a secondary endocrine disease, uh, which means that the pituitary is not able to release its hormones to affect all the different glands in the body. And if it happens at the level of the hypothalamus, we call this a tertiary endocrine disease. So now we know that pituitary is not working, the glands are not working because the main master over here, the hypothalamus is not working properly. Now, regulation happens uh, by 
a short loop and a long loop. This is basically the feedback that I described to you guys before. Now we'll, we'll explain it more in depth. When we talk about short loop, this means that the anterior pituitary is the one that's uh, inhibiting. So basically, let's say the hypothalamus sent way too many signals to the anterior pituitary, and now the anterior pituitary is releasing way too many hormones. Those hormones will go back to the hypothalamus and they'll be like, listen, we're doing too much. We need to slow down. This is what we call short loop feedback, okay? So the anterior pituitary is releasing too much hormone, too much of one of its hormones. The hypothalamus will sense that, okay, we're, we're see, uh, we're, the pituitary is releasing way too many hormones. So the hypothalamus will start sending less signals. Now, long loop is when a peripheral hormone will exert its effects. So for example, testosterone, which is released from the testes, okay? That's a peripheral hormone. It's not secreted by the pituitary or the hypothalamus. Now, if we have too much testosterone, it will go back to the anterior pituitary and then to the hypothalamus, and it will tell them to slow down. So the pituitary will start releasing less of um, FSH and LH, and the hypothalamus will start releasing less signals to decrease FSH and LH from the anterior pituitary. Okay, so now we'll be talking about the adrenocorticotropic uh, hormone. This is the first hormone that we will be discussing. So adrenocorticotropic hormone, like we said, is released from the corticotropes, from the anterior pituitary. Now, what is the hormone from the hypothalamus that affects its release? It's called corticotropin-releasing hormone. So it comes from neurons in the hypothalamus, and it goes, binds to its specific uh, receptors in the anterior pituitary. When it binds, it will increase the transcription of the uh, POMC gene, which is responsible for making ACTH. Now, one thing you should know about ACTH is it's originally uh, synthesized as a bigger hormone called uh, propiomelanocortin, and then it is further cleaved down to ACTH, okay? ACTH circulates unbound, so it's not uh, bound to any proteins in the serum. It's uh, freely circulating, and the half-life is 10 minutes. It binds to melanocortin 2 receptor in the adrenal cortex, okay? So the adrenal, uh, the adrenal glands sit on top of the kidneys, and the melanocortin 2 receptors in the adrenal cortex will receive the ACTH, and once ACTH binds to those receptors, um, it will release cortisol and corticosterone. So again, recap. CRH is released from the hypothalamus. CRH will go and bind to uh, the receptors in the anterior pituitary. Once it binds, it will increase the transcription of the POMC gene. It will increase the synthesis of ACTH. Once ACTH is synthesized and secreted by the anterior pituitary, it will go and bind to melanocortin 2 receptor in the adrenal cortex. And now the adrenal uh, gland will release cortisol and corticosterone. Uh, this is basically everything we said, but they're talking about the uh, molecular mechanism. So essentially CRH, the corticotropin releasing hormone, will bind to its receptors in the anterior pituitary. Once it binds, it is, um, it's linked to a G-stimulatory protein which is linked to adenylyl cyclase. So adenylyl cyclase will convert ATP to cyclic AMP, which will uh, activate protein kinase A. When protein kinase A is activated, it will go to phosphorylate the POMC uh, gene. And once the POMC gene is phosphorylated, this means it is activated. This means it will start synthesizing ACTH. Now, for the feedback over here, cortisol and corticosterone have a negative feedback on CRH and ACTH secretion. This means if I have too much cortisol in the body, the cortisol will signal the hypothalamus and the pituitary. It will tell the hypothalamus, please stop secreting so much CRH. 
And when you stop secreting so much CRH, this will uh, affect the ACTH secretion. That's one way. Another way is it will also tell the pituitary to stop secreting so much ACTH, okay? So this is how the feedback over here happens. Now, there are certain uh, conditions, for example, Addison's disease, where people have a lot of ACTH being secreted, okay? Uh, this is a pathologic process, obviously. It is not normal. And what you will find in these individuals is that there is hyperpigmentation. Why is there hyperpigmentation? Because ACTH affects melanocytes. It activates them, so a lot of melanin will start being secreted, and this will result in hyperpigmentation. Now, one thing to know about ACTH is that it's pulsatile with diurnal secretion. Okay, what does this mean? It means that it peaks at a certain time in the day, then dips down. When does it peak? It peaks early in the morning because it is linked with our circadian rhythm. Okay, so early in the morning when you're just waking up, ACTH levels are very high. Okay, now this pattern is reversed in people uh, who work night shifts. So people who work all uh, over the night and they sleep in the morning, their ACTH secretion is reversed because like I said, it's linked to our circadian rhythm and their circadian rhythm is reversed, okay? So you will find that their ACTH peaks at night instead of morning because they are sleeping in the morning. Now, what are the effects of glucocorticoids? They prevent hypoglycemia. So they don't allow the blood sugar levels to dip down a lot. They inhibit inflammation and they suppress the immune system. This is why when someone gets a transplant, they start giving them glucocorticoids so, so that the immune system does not reject this transplant. Now there are um, certain influences that can affect the pituitary other than the hormones. So nerve excitation can affect its uh, function. Emotional stress can affect, it, uh, can affect its function. Sleep-wake cycles, like we said uh, in just, a, like just a while ago, and other hormones can also affect its function, okay? Now we'll talk about thyroid-releasing hormone. So thyroid-releasing hormone is secreted from the hypothalamus. It will go to the anterior pituitary, bind and then activate thyrotropes so that thyrotropes can release their thyroid stimulating hormone, okay? So when thyroid releasing hormone is secreted from the hypothalamus, it will go and bind to its receptors, okay? When it binds to its receptors, it's a, it's a GQ coupled receptor, okay? So it will uh, uh, activate phospholipase C and uh, PIP2. Now, this will cause IP3 to increase. What does IP3 do? It increases calcium release from the endoplasmic reticulum, and it also activates protein kinase C. When it activates protein kinase C, this will phosphorylate the MAPK gene, okay? This is, you, you don't really honestly need to know the details of this. Just know that um, thyroid releasing hormone is what affects uh, the, uh, the synthesis and release of thyroid stimulating hormone from the thyrotropes, okay? Now, the, uh, the pattern of secretion is very high at night. It's also diurnal, so it peaks and then dips down. So it peaks at night and it follows a light dark pattern. So it peaks at night in uh, a dark environment. That's why we really care about children sleeping early and sleeping in a, a, a dark room because we want the thyroid stimulating hormone to be secreted so that their growth uh, is normal. Now, uh, like we said, uh, like I already mentioned the different uh, functions of the thyroid stimulating hormone. You don't really need to know the details over here. Just know that thyroid stimulating hormone affects the thyroid and it stimulates every single function that keeps up the survival of the thyroid, okay? So it will uh, promote the survival of the thyroid epithelial cells. It will cause the thyroid to hypertrophy, to become bigger, to make more cells, to increase the survival of the cells, okay? So you need to know that TSH is what keeps the thyroid functioning, okay? One thing you need to know is that certain regions in the world, they don't have a lot of iodide intake. 
iodide is found in salt, okay? So when they don't have a lot of iodide intake, TSH levels are elevated, they are high. This is negative feedback, okay? So we have low iodide, high TSH. So why are their TSH levels uh, like higher than normal? Because their iodide is lower than normal, okay? Their iodide intake. One thing that you also need to know is that if we have too much TSH levels in the body, the thyroid will start growing at a very rapid, uh, like it will start uh, growing very rapidly and it will become very big to the point where you can see a bulge in the neck. This is what we call a goiter, okay? So if you see goiter, this means that this person has elevated TSH levels. Um, okay, so for uh, negative feedback, thyroid stimulating hormone, if we have too much TSH being secreted, it negatively uh, inhibits uh, by, by, I mean, by negative feedback, it will inhibit the release of TRH from the hypothalamus. And also the T3 and T4 hormones that are secreted from the thyroid, if we have too much T3 and T4, they will also inhibit TSH and TRH uh, release okay you also need to know that tsh uh, circulates in the body freely it is not bound to any uh, proteins in the serum now we'll talk about fsh and lh fsh and lh are released from the gonadotrope uh, cells in the anterior uh, pituitary and they have two axes that they uh, that they affect. We have the hypothalamic pituitary testes axis because it, they affect the testes and the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis because they uh, affect the ovary. Now, you know that the gonads are responsible, the gonads, which is basically the testes, the ovary, they are responsible for producing the gametes, so the sex cells, and to make steroid uh, hormones, so estrogen progesterone for the ovary, and uh, testosterone for the testes, okay? So this is all the function of the gonads and the gonads do not function properly without FSH and LH, okay? Now, FSH and LH are regulated by gonadotropin-releasing hormone. So gonadotropin-releasing hormone is released from the hypothalamus to affect the pituitary so that the pituitary can release FSH and LH. Another name for gonadotropin-releasing hormone is luteinizing hormone, okay? Now, again, uh, they're talking about like the specific biological mechanism which gonadotropin-releasing hormone affects it. So it, it is bound to two receptors, a GS receptor and a GQ receptor. So like we said, GS activates adenyl cyclase, which activates protein kinase A. In this case, it will go and phosphorylate this gene. For phospholipase C, it will increase uh, calmodulin, which activates this gene, and it will also activate protein kinase C. Protein kinase C will go phosphorylate this gene over here. You honestly don't really need to know this, but I guess read it just to be safe. Now, one thing you need to know about FSH and LH is that they are packed into different secretory granules, so they are not secreted together. Okay, and they are not secreted in equal amounts uh, either. Uh, gonadotropins promote testosterone secretion in males and estrogen and progesterone secretion in females, which is just like we discussed. Uh, FSH also increases a specific uh, hormone called inhibin in both males and females. Okay, so FSH and NH increase estrogen progesterone in females and testosterone in males and inhibit in both males and females, okay? Now, like we said, it also promotes stereogenesis, so the, the formation of uh, steroid hormones. And now we'll talk about the feedback loop. So in males, testosterone and estrogen uh, will inhibit the release of FSH and LH at the level of the pituitary, okay? By by a long loop. So what did uh, we mean by a long loop? This means it will affect it at the level of the pituitary and at the level of the hypothalamus. So if we have too much test uh, testosterone and too much uh, estrogen, 
it will go back to the pituitary, go back to the hypothalamus and tell them to slow down with the release of gonadotropin releasing hormone and the release of FSH and LH. Okay. In girls, it's the same thing, but it's just different hormones. So progesterone and testosterone are what cause the negative feedback loop. In males, it's, it's testosterone and estrogen. And you need to know these, okay? Know them very well. For inhibin, it also uh, has a negative feedback loop, but only on FSH, selectively on FSH. So it inhibits the secretion of FSH only, okay? In both males and females. For um, estrogen, when you have high estrogen levels for more than three days, uh, luteinizing hormone will actually increase. So high estrogen, this will affect the secretion of luteinizing hormone from the hypothalamus, okay? This is a positive feedback loop, and this is important in promoting ovulation, okay? Now we'll move to growth hormone, which is secreted by um, somatotropes. Uh, from the uh, anterior pituitary, okay? A major target of growth hormone is uh, insulin-like growth factor, and this is secreted from the uh, liver. And that's that's really all you need to know here. Okay. So the hypothalamus inhibits the release of growth hormone by a protein called somatostatin, okay? And um, one thing that you also need to know is that ghrelin, which is a protein from the stomach, promotes the secretion of growth hormone, okay? Now, this is again the, the biological mechanism of uh, how growth, like how does it bind and how does it uh, exert all of its effects? Um, you don't really need to know it, just go over it, read it very briefly. And just know that the half-life of growth hormone is 20 minutes and that it is degraded in the liver and the kidneys. Now, what are the effects of growth hormone? It's a protein anabolic hormone. This means it promotes the formation of protein. That's why the cells will start taking in more amino acids to start making uh, more proteins, okay, for growth hormone. Now, if we have a deficiency in growth hormone in children, this will cause dwarfism. So they will become very short, okay, dwarfs, mashi. This is if the deficiency is in childhood. If we have too much growth hormone in childhood, we call it gigantism. And if we have too much growth hormone, but in adults, it's called acromegaly, okay? So if too much growth hormone happens in childhood before the epiphyseal plates, Close, it's gigantism. If too much growth hormone in adults after the epiphyseal plates are already fused and closed, this is called acromegaly, okay? Now we reach uh, prolactin. Now prolactin is um, a unique hormone. Why is it unique? Because prolactin is a hormone under uh, tonic inhibition. This means prolactin is always inhibited unless there was a specific trigger that causes its release, okay? Now, prolactin is tonically inhibited, and this inhibition happens because of dopamine. So we have dopamine that is uh, inhibiting prolactin. That's why if uh, certain people like um, schizophrenic patients, if they take antipsychotics, antipsychotics will inhibit the release of dopamine, okay? So we will not have dopamine anymore. So you will find that their prolactin levels will become high because there is no more dopamine and the dopamine was the hormone that is inhibiting prolactin. So they don't have dopamine anymore. Their prolactin levels are high, okay? Now, what is something that triggers the release of prolactin? The suckling uh, reflex. So when, when the mom... When the mom's baby starts suckling at her breast, prolactin levels increase, okay? So over here, they're just talking about the, the pattern of secretion of uh, prolactin. In nursing females, suckling induces a rapid rise in serum prolactin, like I told you guys, because this is a positive feedback loop. The more suckling, the more prolactin increases, okay? Prolactin can also... Um, transiently increase uh, in response to stress, fear, and uh, like 
just like any um any situation that can cause a person to be stressed or fearful and over here is the point about the drugs that i told you guys about and yeah now we have a, a condition called panhypopituitarism this means um this is something that has to do with the pituitary so the pituitary is not functioning properly so you will find that this person this person has hypothyroidism because uh, the thyroid stimulating hormone is not being released. They will have uh, decreased uh, glucocorticoids because the corticotropin releasing hormone is not being released. And you will find that there is less secretion of gonadotropic hormones because FSH and LH are not being released. Okay. Okay, so now we'll continue talking about the posterior pituitary. This should be very, very easy. Now, the posterior pituitary, like I said, is also known as the neurohypophysis. Um, and it's essentially an extension of the hypothalamus, and it develops from neural ectoderm. Okay, now um, we have um, magnocellular cells because they are very big. <clears throat> These are the cells that send their projections down to the uh, posterior uh, pituitary, and they project from the paraventricular nucleus and the supraoptic nucleus, okay? So we have the supraoptic nucleus, paraventricular uh, nucleus. They, um, the cells originate there, and then they send their axons down to the uh, posterior pituitary. The posterior pituitary is responsible for the secretion of two hormones, ADH and oxytocin. Okay, now one thing you should know, ADH and oxytocin are uh, very small proteins, about nine amino acids, and they have the same structure. The only difference between them is two amino acids. So they are essentially synthesized as the same hormone. And then um, by the addition of the two extra amino acids, this is what determines if this hormone is going to be oxytocin or ADH. They are also secreted with a copeptide. Uh, ADH is secreted uh, with, sorry, oxytocin is secreted with neurofycin 1, and ADH is secreted with neurofycin 2. Okay. Um, they are stored in secretory uh, granules, and we also have uh, pituocytes, which aid in the storage and release of ADH and oxytocin. The posterior pituitary is also uh, very heavily vascularized, but this time it is vascularized by the inferior hypophyseal artery, and this artery is what takes the ADH and oxytocin to the um, body's circulation, Okay. So one thing you should know is that the transport, the axonal transport uh, of the axonal transport that sends the signals to posterior pituitary to release ADH or uh, oxytocin depends on signals from the body. When the body gets that signal, it is conveyed through fast ATP dependent uh, channels, okay? Now, the release of those two hormones is due to a stimulus that happens, okay? So when this stimulus happens, and we'll talk more about it, um, at the axonal terminal, which is over here, there will be a surge in uh, intracellular calcium, okay? When this intracellular calcium increases, this causes um, the release of either ADH or oxytocin, okay? Now, we'll talk about oxytocin first. Uh, oxytocin is a very, very important uh, hormone when it comes to uh, pregnancy and labor. Uh, oxytocin is what uh, stimulates very, very strong uterus contractions so that the mom can deliver the baby. Uh, oxytocin is also increased. The more the, the contraction increases, the more oxytocin is released. And when the cervix starts to dilate and stretch, oxytocin will also be increased in release. So it's released in a positive feedback loop, okay? Um, sometimes we can use oxytocin to start partuition or childbirth. So we can give it to the mom to start uh, uh, childbirth if she's having problems uh, with that. And uh, the uterus sensitivity to oxytocin increases slightly before uh, uh, childbirth okay now even though we can give oxytocin to the mom 
so that uh, childbirth starts. When childbirth is happening naturally, oxytocin is not what initiates partuition. In, uh, <clears throat> okay, so oxytocin is not initiated, is not what initiates partuition. Oxytocin increases after partuition increases, okay? We also have the suckling reflex. Oxytocin uh, aids in the um, lactating process. So it causes the contraction of myoepithelial cells. This causes the milk to, uh, this causes easier uh, milk ejection. Uh, oxytocin and prolactin together induce galactopoiesis, which is basically uh, milk production and the letdown reflex. So basically uh, the ejection of milk to the baby's mouth is caused by oxytocin, okay? Now, I won't uh, go into specific detail about the slides about ADH. I'll just tell you what ADH is. It's basically vasopressin. Um, ADH is secreted when the body senses that we have decreased volume or when we have uh, high tonicity. So basically, if the body has too much salt, we will start uh, secreting ADH. What is the function of ADH? The function of ADH is to retain water, okay? So uh, there will be less water filtration, less water in the urine because we are uh, retaining all of that water, okay? Uh, so if blood volume decreases because the person is dehydrated, if we ate too much salt, okay? This can cause increase in ADH so that uh, water retention happens, okay? Now, how does it do this? When ADH is secreted, it causes the insertion of aquaporin 2 channels. Now, those aquaporin 2 channels, once they are inserted to the apical membrane of the cell, they will start uh, absorbing all that water. In. And that was it. Uh, I think this was a very uh, simple lecture. Uh, I tried my best to just make it kind of like a recap, and I hope you guys found it beneficial. Uh, best of luck.